ready for uh, 2 Timothy chapter 3 and just to uh, give a, a couple of little um, overall views of both First and Second Timothy and Titus, and I bring this up from time to time, is, is that I want you to notice that as Paul writes to these leaders, what he's focusing on is, a, is mainly doctrine, teaching, learning, correcting, rebuking, instruction. I want you to notice how devoid of miracles, manifestations of the Holy Spirit are in this. And he's not, and I don't want anybody to get the wrong idea, and I don't want people to think I'm saying something that I'm not. It's not that those things aren't part of the kingdom of God. It's that Paul, again, is placing things in the order of importance. Do you know what I mean? If we have the manifestations of the Holy Spirit, but we don't have correction, rebuke, instruction, and good doctrine. You've got a bunch of fluff heads. You've got, yeah, you've got, you don't have, God is not going to be recognized in that. See, God is recognized in, in your nature and character. Not in the miraculous. I mean, He is, but you know what? The enemy, you know, the enemy can do seemingly miraculous things. So it's difficult for people to recognize the, or recognize the glory, recognize what God is without the nature and character operating through human beings. You know, Jesus did all of those wonderful miracles and yet it was when he, when he taught with authority, when he taught the things that he taught, that's when the people recognized that this guy was different. Because you know what? Elijah did miracles. Elisha did miracles. It was the nature and character that people recognized. That's when you recognize the real glory of God, is when you act and react differently than other people. So that's why that's kind of devoid, is because Paul is trying to keep things in order. And notice he says a lot of things like be careful and watch out and watch out for false teachers. And, and we learned that uh, it said back in 1 Timothy, it said, you know, take, take interest or take heed, be careful of the doctrine, for in doing so you will save both yourself and others. You know, a lot of people, they're not interested in doctrine, but yet if we read through 1 Timothy, 2 Timothy, and Titus, Paul is dealing with that constantly. He uses that word several times. So it carries an importance with it. I know it's not wonderfully wonderful to hear that, but that's the way that it is. Yeah, that's yeah, when salvation comes, we're glad for it. But so many times we want to put it on the back burner and it's supposed to be a, close pretty up there up front. Okay, we'll start in, in chapter, uh, chapter 3, verse 1. It says, but mark this, there will be terrible times in the last days. You know, this is, this is, this is Dr. Bartley's favorite. I mean, there was a time, and maybe he's, he doesn't now, but there was a time when we used to go to visit him in conferences. He was always on this, or he'd, he'd come back to it. This was one of his favorite scriptures. He said, there will be terrible times in the last days. Now, we're already in the last days, right? Okay, people will be lovers of themselves, lovers of money, boastful, proud, abusive. And what's the next one? Disobedient to parents. I think it's interesting that we have all our children here today. You know, usually some are gone and, you know, we don't have all of them many times, all of them here at once. But it isn't it amazing that they show up right when we, right when we read this, disobedient to parents. <laughs> and it's terrible times when they are, right? Yeah. When they're disobedient. It's terrible times. <laughs> Ungrateful, unholy, without love, unforgiving, slanderous, without self-control, brutal, not lovers of the good, treacherous, rash, conceited, lovers of pleasure rather than lovers of God, 
Notice what it says, having a form of godliness, but denying its power. And it says, have nothing to do with such people. That's a pretty stout statement. In today's day and age, when we're told to all, you know, always be inclusive and include everyone, it says have nothing to do with them. Now, we have to, when we read this, we can't read this as separate parts of the Bible. Do you know what I mean? We have to read this in context with everything he's ri- written in 1 Timothy, 2 Timothy, and when we get to Titus. So when he says, having a form of godliness but not denying its power, that means we're talking about religious people, remember? And you have to understand, what did we learn, was it a a week or two or three ago, is that when you're in religion, all of these things here are hidden. See, people who are not religious, we can see this on the outside, right? We can see conceit on the outside. We We can see brutal. How many of you watch the news? You see brutal? Do you see, um, you know, rash? Do you see um, terrible times? Do you see ungrateful people, unholy, unforgiving, and slanderous? You know, you watch the news. Is there any slander in the news today? You, you see what I mean? But when, it, when we get to the believers, these things are hidden. So we have to recognize that many times these people are around us, and, and they have these traits, but we don't even recognize it because it's hidden under a form of godliness. But they deny the power that will free them from these things. See, it doesn't mean that God, they don't say that God has power. It means that every time that power comes in and tries to deliver us of these things, we deny it access. And we'll get to this in a little more detail here as I read further on down. They deny the access of God coming in and freeing them from these things. So these things stay hidden, and many times we don't even know we have them. Until something brings them out. You know, how many of you have found out, as, as people have dealt with you, I know everyone here deals with each other, and Kathy's dealt with people, and some of you dealt with, and I've dealt with people. And, and how many of you recognize that when, as you start to deal with somebody, maybe one of these terrible things will come out? And you didn't even know you had it. And it's terrible times sometimes for a little bit, isn't it? <laughs> well, they are. Yeah. <clears throat> so when we read terrible times in the last days, don't think of this as always something bad, okay? Because as these things get exposed, they're terrible times, but can they lead to good times? Yes, absolutely. So, so when we read this, we read this as though we don't want this to happen, but we actually do. Yeah, we want the terrible times to come because, like you just said, that gets it out. It gets it out into the open. What we don't want is a form of godliness that denies the power thereof, but there's going to be terrible times. If you get a group of people together and we're all trying to become like Jesus, you know what? There's going to be terrible times. There's going to be, it, that's just the way that it is. It's not a cakewalk. It's not fun all the time. It's not ooey, ooey, ah, ah, you know, touchy-feely, God's dropping on me and I feel good. Sometimes there's terrible times. So when we read this, don't always say, oh, I don't want that. Yes, we do. But what we don't want is the form of godliness that denies the power. Because those terrible times will not turn into good times if we deny Him access. And that thing will just keep coming up and coming up and coming up. It says, have nothing to do with such people. Which ones? Well, the ones that deny the power thereof. Why is that? Why do you think He says have nothing to do with them? Not only does it get off on you, she said they get off on you. Not only that, but it also becomes a tremendous discouragement to try to deal with people who want to deny God any access. You know what I mean? There's too many people who want to allow God access into their lives. Because if you just have terrible times all the time, what's that gonna, how's that going to affect your walk with God if it's always terrible times? Huh? 
Yeah, it's going to, once again, it's going to, it's going to cause you to withdraw inside of yourself and not want to deal with people. Yeah, your love grows cold because lawlessness abounds. It's just another form of lawlessness. So that's one of the reasons that I, I know some people think this is wrong and, and you're going to think we're hard about it, but we don't deal a lot with people who deny God access. I don't want to waste my time. I don't like terrible times. If it'll lead to good times, then it's worth it. But if it's only going to lead to more terrible times and more terrible times, and this is going to go on and on and on and on with terrible times, I don't want to waste my time. You know, it affects me, it affects those around, whoever is wanting to be terrible all the time. So we want to get free and we want to get, we want to get set free of these things. And people, even, even when we get set free of these things, how difficult is it for us to confront other people? Even when you know that that person wants God and probably in the end will be okay and you'll have good, and you'll have good times, but how many of you want to go through that terrible time? It's very difficult, even when there's a good time at the end. So what are you going to do if there's always terrible times at the end? It becomes a real drag in a hurry. Nobody likes that. So it says, have nothing to do with such people. It says, they are the kind who worm their way into homes and gain control over... I think the King James says silly, this mine says gullible women, vulnerable, who are loaded down with sins and are swayed by all kinds of evil desires. Always learning, but never able to come to the knowledge of the truth. Now, I just want to stop there for a minute. And why does Paul single out women? Because women have a tendency, because they're such good communicators, and they love to communicate, and they love detail, is if you notice when you work... If you go to a workplace, where do you normally have the trouble, with the men or with the women? And why is that? It's because they love to talk about, and I'm, and I'm talking about not kingdom women, I'm talking about woman as she has fallen. Women love to talk about their problems, not only their problems, but also the problems that they have with anybody else, and they'll talk over it with anybody else. And so how many of you women have gotten caught into talk and before you realized it, you've been sucked into something that afterwards you recognized, I got, I was gullible. I was silly. <laughs> I was vulnerable. See, women seem to be, in the area of communication, seem to be more vulnerable in that area. I'm not saying the men don't do it. I'm saying that women have a tendency to, to be a little more vulnerable because, like Kathy has told me a lot of times, she says, just talking about it makes, pe makes women feel better. See, men don't like to talk about it. Men like to fix it. But women sometimes, a lot of times, will like to talk about it, and then they'll feel better after they've talked about it, even though nothing's been fixed. Now, we don't want to amen that, because we don't want to amen the problem, right? So we don't want to say amen. This is not a woman-hating thing or anything. That's just, it's the different types of... It's the different makeup of, each di of the different sexes that cause this. And that's why Paul writes that, is because men are able to recognize that and exploit it. And that's what he's writing here. Teachers, are, and, and they're able to exploit that concept that, that women... I mean, how many women get involved in adulterous relationships because the man will listen to what they say and their husband won't? How many times do you think that's happened? You know, well, he'll listen to me. You never listen. You're, you're in front of the TV. You're zoned out in your nothing box. You don't listen, but he listens. Do you know, understand there's a reason why he's listening? <laughs> I mean, do you think he just wants to listen? To listen? Or do you think he's wanting to take captive a gullible woman? Huh? You see what I'm saying? He's listening for a reason. And that's what these, a lot of these f teachers do, is that they will, if you notice, and I, it's kind of bothersome sometimes, is that most of the time, what sex, what sex is it that is in the charismatic move? Women. Is in the charismatic move. Now, 
because they are such communicators and because they have that personality, even under the kingdom of God, it'll probably be that way for a while. Because they're able to communicate with God, they're able to receive from God much easier than men can. But if you notice, most of the time when these nutcases nut case, nut get out there, like, uh, well, I don't want to mention any names, most of them are dead now, look at how, who, who's following most of those people. It's women. Because, because men learn how to exploit that. And that's what Paul is writing about here. And you say, well, Mike, why, why, are you teaching all of the, why are you teaching this to us? Well, first of all, we've got an Internet audience. And second of all, again, remember what, Timothy has, or what Paul has been writing. Be careful. Watch your doctrine. Be vigilant. Why? Because these things are constantly attacking people through the world system. Okay? <clears throat> It says, gullible women who are loaded down with sins and are swayed by all kinds of evil desires. Always learning but never able to come to the knowledge of the truth. Just as Janus and Jambres oppose Moses, so also these teachers oppose the truth. Now, I just want to stop right there. And we read, you know, we read over this and we don't recognize what's going on here. Is who, who, who here knows who Janus and Jambres were? Three people. The rest of you don't know who they were? Four people? They were the guys that, uh, that, 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 uh, that the magicians that were in Pharaoh's time that came and opposed Moses. And the first thing we have to recognize is that they opposed Moses with the same thing that Moses was using. So Paul is making a comparison here about false teachers. You know, false teachers use the Word of God just like we do. Think about it. They, they preach... Well, let me, I have to back up a minute. Why were they opposing Moses? To show, yeah, but, but what, was, what was the ultimate goal? Yeah, they said... This, I'm looking for something else. What was the ultimate goal? What was Moses wanting to do? Take, oh, there you go. Take the people to what? Worship or what? Give value to God. See? And that's why Janus and Jambres and Pharaoh and all of them, that's why they opposed God. See, religion doesn't mind keeping God as a servant. It's when you start giving God kingship, value, that the resistance comes. Do you know what I mean? When, when, and, and that we'll use exactly the same thing. We say, well, how do we use the Word of God to not show value? How about preaching salvation to go to heaven? Do we preach salvation here? Yeah. Do they preach salvation in other churches? But, but tell me, where is the value in God in preaching salvation is about going to heaven? There's no value at all. It's all the value for you to go to heaven. You see what I mean? They sing. Do all churches sing? Most of them do. Can we say most churches sing? Why do you and I sing? Because we're here to give God value. And how many of you love the songs that honor God and give God? Put Him in a higher place. Put Him in a kingship area. We love, I, I watch it. I watch it here every time. And whenever there's a song that exalts God, it gets more intense. You know what I mean? I mean, people have fun when we sing Rain Down. They have, they, you know, or they'll, they'll they, but when we have a song that exalts the king as him as king, ruler over us, I watch people, it, you, you, they catch something. And you, I'm sure you worship leaders can feel it. I know Kathy feels it because she'll say, boy, during this song, boy, people really grabbed on and then it kind of drifted away and then they grabbed on. Why? Because they're songs that are exalting him as kingship. And that's why Janus and Jambres resisted Moses because people don't care. And I have people tell me this all the time. Oh, they really love God. Oh, they really love the Lord. But they love the Lord in a subservient position. In other words, he's there to comfort me. He's there to heal me. He's there to prosper me. 
But the minute his rulership starts to come in, we've got Janus and Jambres. Yeah, they not only deny the power, but we have already read, disobedient to parents. What's that? I love my parents as long as they provide for me and do what I want. The minute they exalt, exert kingship over me, I resist. I resist. You know, no child is going to resist if me as a parent walk up with a hundred dollar bill and say, here, do you take this. Yeah. <laughs> They're not going to say, no, I'm going to resist that. No, they won't. Trust me. If you handed a hundred dollars, you could walk up to any child. Uh, 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 if I had any child, any parent could walk up to a child and hand them a hundred dollar bill and say, take this. And they, say, they wouldn't say, no, I'm not going to do that. You can't make me do that. They're going to grab that thing and run, just like you did. You were, that's perfect. Because that's exactly what they're going to do. Because, that's what they, because they want that. But tell them they can't have something. Tell them to brush your teeth. Tell them it's time to go to bed. Tell them you know, anything of, of the sort. And immediately the resistance comes. And we love, people, most people who love the Lord love Him in a subservient position. That's how they love Him. If you listen to Him, oh, they love Him. You know, that's why you have to be careful when you sing to, to a crowd. They'll come up and they'll cry and, oh, you know, it's just so wonderful. Yeah, it, it is. But are they recognizing what you're singing as Him as King over their life? Or as a subservient servant that's just there to comfort them? See, when Jesus served the people, oh, he had thousands. Remember when he made, had the loaves, fish and the loaves, and when he'd heal, and when he'd deliver people of demons? Oh, they were following him like crazy. But when Pilate brought him out and said, here is your king, what did they say? Yeah, see, that's see, that's what you, these are what you do. This is what you have to watch for when you're in church services, in our own lives, in our church services, in the teachings that you listen to. Are they preaching him as king and ruler over your life? Not as not just as a position that we look at, but as a king who has rulership over your life. Right now, yeah, not in heaven, not later on. But does he have rulership over your life right now? And so when Pilate said, remember when he wrote, the king of the Jews. Remember what the Pharisees said? No, don't put that there. Just write that he said he was the king of the Jews. Because they didn't even want it written, let alone have him be over them. And so what did they yell when he brought out the king of the Jews, crucify him, kill him. I mean, that theme is all through the, the Gospels. You know, we'll not have this man to rule over us, and he's the heir, come, let us kill him. You know, we'll get the inheritance. It's any time that, that the rulership begins to come forth, that's when you find out when people really love God is when the rulership comes forth. See, most people just want God, like I said, in that subservient position. You're there to meet my wants, and, it, and even that's twisted. Because is Jesus a servant? Yes, he is. Remember what he said? He who wants to be the ruler, or a ruler, must be servant of how many? All. But we twist that, and we humanize it, and we don't recognize that when Jesus said that, that meant that you were to be under God, and serve people through being under God. Not leaving God out of it, and serving man the way he wants. That's how they interpret it, is we'll serve man the way he wants. So children don't mind parents as long as you provide them with a home, do their laundry, cook their meals, give them toys, computer games, TVs, electronics, cars. Oh, then you're, oh, that's great. Then, you're, then they'll be with your parents. 
But the minute you exert some kind of rulership over them, then they start to resist. And that's what he said, these terrible times are coming, because we see that in each successive generation, it's getting worse, isn't it? Well, Paul is warning us. Paul is trying to teach us. He's trying to show us where we need to recognize. I mean, I know most of us here, I'm sure probably all of us here, want God as king over our lives. At least we say we do. But many times, even when he comes in and tries to rule over us, we still have, we still have terrible times. <laughs> we still want to be disobedient to our parents. You know what I mean? <clears throat> but the idea is to not have a form of godliness and deny that power. And so Janus and Jambres, that's that's the whole idea is they used the same thing that Moses was using to resist Moses. And many times people will use this word as a resistance. I know it's going to be hard to believe, but you can use this word as a resistance against Jesus' kingship. I know lots of people who love God as a servant. But they don't love Him. See, when, when the kingship shows up, that's when these things that we started out in chapter 3, that's when they start to manifest. Until then, they're hidden. But when the rulership of God comes in, that's when all of these, ter- that's when all these things we read begin to manifest. That's when you find slander, pride, boastful, brutal. Consider nothing sacred, ungrateful, unholy, unforgiving, without self-control, not lovers of the good, treacherous, conceited, lovers of pleasure rather than lovers of God. When his kingship shows up, that's when we find out what we have inside of us. That's why I said us. I mean, I hope we recognize, I hope we've grown to a point where even without reading these things here in 2 Timothy, Timothy, we recognize and and when these things come up, we want to get free of them. I mean, I'm sure we've done that. But see, a lot of people, when, you, when they talk about, oh, they love the Lord, you know, like, like in older people, um, people that have been in church all of their lives, oh, they love the Lord so much and they pray for everybody. Yes, but do they love Him as the servant or do they love Him as the King? Do we love Him as the servant? We've got to ask ourselves that question. Do we love Him as the servant? Or do we love him as the king? Is he a servant? Yes. But he's also a king. That's why when we go into other churches and we lift our hands, we're okay as long as we're singing the songs to Jesus like he's the servant. If you sing the song like he's the king, resistance comes. Why? Because you start lifting your hands. Why are you lifting your hands? Why are you bowing down? Why are you lifting your hands? Why, why are you getting so emotional? Come on, why? Because it's emotional. Because you see value in who He is. You're recognizing how big He is and how small you are. And so the people around you are resisting. How easy is it for you to lift your hands in other churches? I mean, you go to a denominational church. Let's go to another church next week here in town and let's lift our hands and, and flag and do all of that. How hard will that be? It, will it be as easy as it is here? No. Why? Because there's resistance against his kingship already in the church, already in that particular body of people. You walk in, you can, how many of you can walk in and feel the resistance to the value of God? Yeah. 
man, well, yeah, that's... <laughs> what are you doing here? <laughs> Boy, we broke them at giving us those posters, I'll tell you that. We haven't had one since. <laughs> haven't had any since. They've never come back. <laughs> but see, that's what it is. It's a resistance. It, they'll sit there, and are they in church? They go to church. Every week they have a church service, don't they? But they go as Jesus is my servant, not my king. And so you and I walk in there, we're going in there to go meet a king. Which means what? What does a king represent? A what? A what? Ruler? Full of what? Full authority. Rulership over you? <clears throat> Uh, for full power, what? The boss. How about, does a king get honor? How about um, respect? Thank you. Time, love. See? What does a servant get? Ordered around. Sound familiar? I mean, does that sound, does that play right into what's going on? Order, get ordered around. Gets thought of lightly. Is only there for certain purposes when I need him. Some of you that work can relate to that. You're only there to meet other people. Yeah, you're, that's the only reason you're there. And so we want to show value to our king, and that irritates Janice and Jambres to no end. You see, the children of Israel, you know they were God's people all during that time in Egypt. But when God, but when God told Moses to say, bring the people out here that they may give value to me, that's when the resistance started. There was no resistance until then. Because God was the servant when they were in, in Egypt. But when he said, come to the mountain and worship me, Janice and Jambers rise up. So just remember that the next time we're in a service or, and you want to lift your hands and you feel that <laughs> Janice and Jambers are right there over the top of you. Holding your arms down. <clears throat> just as Janice and Jambers oppose Moses, so also these teachers oppose the truth. Which is what? What's the truth? There you go. That he is the king. See, that's the truth. And they'll oppose that. Very difficult for me to be in the inner church council when we were here because all the leaders opposed the truth. They opposed Jesus as being king. He was great as a servant, but they opposed him as being king and ruler. And you're going to face that. It's nice to be able to come here every week, isn't it? But you know, some days you're going to, sometimes, and even in charismatic circles, folks, this has to be discerned. Because in a lot of charismatic circles, this is how Jesus has been taught. As he's the servant for us. Not the king. <clears throat> Do you ever want to be careful around a king? Why? <laughs> Off with your what? <laughs> Off with your head. <clears throat> I mean, I understand that God is not an earthly king, but we use that illustration. So we want to be careful that we're not slack, we're not, well, he's my good buddy, he's my pal, he's my bud. You know, they deserve high respect. And you're careful around them. You learn what they like. You want to give them honor and respect and the things that they desire. If they're a good king, is Jesus a good king? Yes. Yeah, okay, so he's a good king, right? Yes. I mean, we have earthly kings that are a bad representation. But you know, there have been good kings. Mm -hmm. Kings that people loved in, in their country. And they honor them, they applaud them, they... If you, I know we still have some monarchies here in the world. I think Great Britain has them. And look at how they treat 
you know, Queen Elizabeth and, and Prince, Prince Philip. And uh, look at how they're treated. Okay, I think you get the idea. But they will not get very far because in this case, because in the case of these men, their folly will be clear to everyone. You, however, know all about my teaching, my way of life, my purpose, faith, patience, love, endurance, persecutions, sufferings, what kinds of things happened to me at Antioch, Iconium, and Lystra. The persecutions I endured, yet the Lord rescued me from all of them. In fact, everyone who wants to live, God, live godly life or live a godly life in Christ Jesus, Jesus will be persecuted. Now, why is that? Did you say most people would? Some people. Couple. Only people in third world countries. Only people in first world countries. What did he say? Everybody, right? Why? Because what? Yeah, because if you live godly in Christ Jesus, God, Jesus, the Word of God, His voice is going to be your ruler. That's why you suffer persecution. You can go to, any, you can go to church, you can quote the Bible, you can, lo, you can love Jesus as subservient, but the minute He becomes ruler over you, that's what creates the persecution. Why is that? They want to be the ruler, but why, who's behind them wanting to be a ruler? Janice and Jambres, and who's behind them? I'm getting all the way up to the top of the line here. Yeah, it's the devil. And so what do we got here? We've got two, we're right back to we've got two spirits that want to be king, right? And as long as the devil's king in your life, no persecution. The minute you want God to be kingship, and it, listen, the devil can be the king in your life, and you can still believe in all of this word. You can still quote it, you can still want to be healed, you can still want to be prospered, you can still want Jesus to comfort you, you can still read the Psalms when somebody dies and you feel better. But Satan's ruling over you. How do we know that? Because when the kingship of Jesus comes forth, you're lovers of yourself, lovers of money, boastful, proud, abusive, disobedient to your parents, ungrateful, unholy, without love, unforgiving, slanderous, without self-control, brutal, not lovers of the good, treacherous, rash, conceited, lovers of pleasure rather than lovers of God, and having a form of godliness. That's how we know. Because the minute the rulership shows up, the persecution shows up. Jesus was fine handing out healings and handing out bread and fish. But when he preached rulership, they crucified him. Okay? In fact, everyone who wants to live a godly life in Christ Jesus will be persecuted, while evildoers and impostors will go from bad to worse, deceiving and being deceived. But as for you, continue in what you have learned and have been become convinced of, because you know those from whom you learned it, and how from infancy you have known the Holy Scriptures. I thought that was interesting that, that Timothy knew from infancy. How do you know from infancy the Holy Scriptures? Boy, they, they must be really... Yeah, he must, they must have really been word people. You know what I mean? I mean from infancy. <clears throat> he doesn't say from infancy you know the cartoons. From infancy, you have known all of the first-person shooter games. It doesn't say that. It says, from infancy, you have known the Holy Scriptures, which are what? Able to make you what? 
wise for salvation through faith in Christ Jesus. All Scripture is God-breathed and is useful for teaching, rebuking, correcting, and training in righteousness, so that the servant of God may be thoroughly equipped for every good work. Now notice it says the servant of God. See, that's where people miss it. They read, they know what it says, and they, they read servant of God, but they actually read it as servant of man. Because you're supposed to be a servant of God. In other words, how can I, if I'm a servant of God, what does that make God? King, the boss. Somebody said the boss, who was it? Yeah. He makes him the boss, right? That means that I do whatever God says. So think about how many people, are, are, and sometimes even us, we call ourselves servants of God, but is he the king over you? Are you really a servant of God? So what we do is we serve man to prove our servant to God. Incorrect. You're a servant to God, his kingship. You know, he loves to be honored. He loves to be valued. He loves to be sung to. He loves to be bowed to. He loves hands raised. He loves to be danced to. So if you're his servant, you're going to be doing that. So if people aren't doing that, to me they're not his servant. I don't care what you tell me. I don't care how friendly they are, how nice they are. That's why it says they have a form of godliness. Do you think people who have a form of godliness are nice people? Of course they are because they have a form of godliness. But they're not going to allow God to be the king over their lives. You and I have to recognize that. In our own lives, is he really king over our attitudes? Is he king over our complaining? Guess I have to get a little deeper, huh? Is he king over our whining? Is he king over our gossip? We love to talk about, you know, the angels who, or the elders who fall down and cry, holy, 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 and the, the lamb in the midst of the throne. And sometimes we have to ask ourselves, you know, how close to, to these people that we just read are we? Like. Because if we were in the throne room, how many of us would do... I don't, I'm not with all of you during the week. But how many of you complain a lot? Would you complain in the midst of the throne room? But we do. Because we're in the midst of it. get angry, get jealous, get competitive. Everybody's looking down at the ground. <laughs> like school kids, you know. <laughs> you ask a question and they all look down like, I hope they don't call on me. <laughs> I know you are. So I just wanted to bring forth this morning the recognition of the carefulness that, that Paul is writing to Timothy, that this walk is a, is a narrow walk. An American has, had, has made it very broad, the American church. You know, um, I love a lot of the teachers that, I, that we listen to, but, you know, a lot of times you can turn things on. Like, like the other day I turned something on. And it said, when we're in our time of crisis is when we're closest to him. Yeah, see, there's one, they got him as a servant. In other words, we're closest to him when we're in our crisis. And then he's there to serve me. Shouldn't we be close to him all the time? In the good times as well as the bad? There shouldn't even be a value of we're closer to him here and closer to him there. It should be we're close to him all the time. Good or bad. You see what I mean? They're placing a value upon when we're close. And so many times I think we need to examine our own lives and find out. How, 
How much is Jesus really king and how much is he servant? When do I talk to him the most? When do I listen to him the most? When do I want to hear him the most? When he's a servant or when he's a king? I don't know anybody who doesn't like to hear God as a servant. You know what I mean by that? How many of you, how many of you pray to God to, to do certain things in your life to help you along? Now, how many of you want to hear God immediately when you pray that prayer? How many of you want to hear God immediately when He wants to be king in your life? <laughs> And how many times when he speaks as king, do we rebuke it as the devil? <laughs> you see what I, or think we or, or we wonder. You see what I mean? You see, that's putting a false balance on his voice. Do you realize that? In other words, if we want him, if we want to hear him, how many how many people are desperate to hear him as a servant? I mean, there's probably people who have terminal diseases, right? They want to desperately hear him as a servant, right? But are we as desperate to want to hear him as a king? See? That's what I'm saying. I want to hear him desperately as a king. As a king. Hey Amen. Any questions? Yes. Terry. Well, thank you for bringing this out today. Gosh, I just, ugh, this is so good. Um, I wanted to share an interesting fact. I um, had done a study on Timothy, and I believe it's his mom, Eunice, that um, he, mm -hmm. he talks, Paul talks about Eunice and Lois. Lois. And his mother, her name means to honor God. Mm. I thought that was pretty cool, yeah. of everything you're talking about and how God just intertwines all of that. Uh-huh. Yeah. Now, see, the Bible says that we come to Jesus so that we can know God. But we turned it into coming to Jesus so that we could go to heaven. We took the honor out of it, see. And that's what I see a lot of people do with the Scriptures is they read them in such a way and teach them in such a way as to take the honor of God out of it, see. See. And so I always love the songs, and uh, I know we need all the songs, don't hear what I'm not saying, but the songs that really exalt God. <clears throat> you know, what was that song we sang, the weight, the weight of Your Glory? Yeah. And uh, just any song that lifts Him up on high is, always touches me a little different than a song about, you know, he's my healer or he's my deliverer or, <clears throat> you know, he set me free from sin. All those things are great and wonderful, but there's something about lifting God up on high that touches me in a different place. Anybody else? Yeah, Paul? He gave me two things. One was when you were talking about the Jews as Jesus was being judged by Pilate. Mm -hmm. And they greatly objected to the idea of him right, making the sign mm -hmm. Jesus is king of the Jews. Now, of course, one reason that they objected was Pilate had the power and authority to proclaim Jesus, King of the Jews. Mm -hmm. And they wanted to object to that greatly. So they said, kill him. Yeah. Yep. And the other thing that he gave me was a real simple one that all of us really know by heart already. And that is, if we have a job, 
and we have a boss. If we obey and do what he says, he's going to pay us, and we're going to be able to eat. Now, if we don't do what he says, we're not going to get a paycheck, and we're not going to eat. We're going to be hungry. Well, of course, it's the same way with God. If we do what he says, we're going to get the bread of life. Mm -hmm. And there's no doubt in that. Mm -hmm. I think it's interesting when Jesus came in on the colt of a donkey, <clears throat> he came in as a servant. And they waved the palm branches and yelled, cried out, Hosanna. When they brought him out as king, they said, crucify him. See? Same crowd. We always think it's a different crowd. It's the same crowd. Yeah, the Pharisees stirred him up, but it, was the, it wasn't the Pharisees that were yelling. The crowd was yelling. It was the same crowd that was waving the palm branches when he came in as a servant. And that's what I see in a lot of churches is we wave the palm branches when he comes in as a servant. And we love the messages, and we wave palm branches and call Hosanna when he's a servant. But when he's preached as king of the Jews, many people want to crucify him. And that's when you find out where we're really at, is when he comes in as king. Amen? I don't know how to correlate so I'm just going to speak and then okay whatever okay so over when we had the girls thing okay some stuff came out mm -hmm. and I felt like I was delivered of it okay and as the week well I'm not going to go into detail I'm okay. just yeah. I'm just saying uh -huh. um so I felt like I was delivered of it and um and I had cried out to God you know to be cleansed from it da 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 so the week's going on, da 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 Something arises, okay? And it's like, okay, well, that's surely not it. You know, like, and like the haughtiness and all that stuff's coming out. And it was the first time, because all the other times when God's asked me to put stuff down, and I hear it through other people and stuff, you know, that violently sticking my tongue out, I know that it's right, so I do it, but like I jokingly go, I'm violently sticking my tongue out. Mm -hmm. Well, this time it was the first time where I could hear in my head, well, that's too hard, and, and you can't do that, you know, and like a line being drawn, mm -hmm. and I recognize that, and it's just like, oh, my goodness, this is how it is so easy for people to throw up the line and say, we're not going there, God. And it is just, I don't know how to correlate it with this, but it, <laughs> sorry. It's like that line is Janice and mm -hmm. that other person saying up, saying this, you right. know, and we want to exalt him as king in our lives. Mm -hmm. So even though it's really hard because it's tough, like you said, it's extremely fierce and difficult for the people of God. It is, but we want to exalt him as king and not put up the boundaries that says, no, I'm not going to allow you to touch yeah, me see, there. See, what you did by, by being delivered is you made Jesus king in your life right there. You see what I mean? See, he came in as king, and you allowed him to come in as king. And see, most people draw the line and go with the resistance. I shouldn't say most people, a lot of people. You know, they'll draw the line, and they will not allow him in as king. They'll allow him in as servant, you know, to comfort them in their time of trouble, to, you know, to make them feel better as they go to church, you know, to fix their problems, you know, pay my bills, whatever it is. They'll allow him in as a servant. It's when he wants to come in as king, that that's, that, and that's why there's always the resistance. That's why those thoughts come to you, you know, well, that's too hard or anything like that. What's that? That's, that's Janice and Jambres coming to you, see? with the resistance. I just absolutely love how you have, um, the work, how it's all just flown out today because it has allowed, because I have been pondering on that because it's just like, how can something so small in my head mm -hmm. 
make me go, okay, well, that's it. You know, something so small. And how can something like that knock people out? And it's like, and so I've been pondering on that. Like, I don't want that to happen. So this, bringing this like this today is amazing. Oh, so good. thank you, God. Yes, thank you, Lord. Yes, that's a good one. Yes, thank you. <clears throat> because when she just said, knocks people out, in praise and worship, before you even started, I was thinking, because, you know, sometimes you have people come and say, you know, like, well, where's your miracles or where's your healings? Or even us ourselves sometimes say, like, oh, we're supposed to be walking this better. And we should, and kind of with the context of we should be seeing more miracles and healings and all of that. And just be, after worship, before you started saying anything, like, the thought came to me, I've seen so many churches in my walk that had what everybody thought was all these great miracles, mm-hmm. all these mm-hmm. great healings, all this great stuff, but they didn't have what you're talking about today. And when push come to shove, they've walked away from all of right. that. So the, all the miracles, all the healings, all of the big mm-hmm. miraculous things do not hold people with God. You know, it's that heartfelt, you're the king. And dang, I took, I don't know if I can find it, but mine said, I don't know if I have it in the right place if I can find it. Yeah, mine says in verse 17, then you will be God's servant, fully mature and perfectly prepared to fulfill any assignment God gives you. So it's like, if you're going along in the miracle and healings, and now all of a sudden God comes in and wants to be king and deal with your character, that's maybe assignment that he's given you. Mm -hmm. And if you're not walking in this. And see, the, the hard thing is you don't know that in the beginning. You think it's all about the miracles yeah, and all the healing and all yeah, that stuff. Sure. So, like, I'm just so grateful for what we learn here and the stuff we have here because I think we get all this stuff grounded. Then miracles and healings and all that stuff, if they start manifesting and following us around, that's not what we're going to be in it for. And so the, yeah. the, when the king comes, the enemy's not going to be able to knock us out. That, yeah. That's good. Yeah, that's what, that's what God's working. That's something that's never been built before. That's what we're looking for, is we fix the nature, and God fixes our nature and character. Then when the real miracles come, the real deal, it won't knock us out. We'll have everything in the proper order. And we want to have things in the proper order. And, uh, yeah, see... Yeah, when the enemy comes, he'll find no place in us. And that's always been my heart's cry, is to have the nature and character. I just think that the miracles will follow behind. Instead of going after them, I think they're going to follow us. And, uh, well, I think they already have to some extent, you know. And I like the way you put it, because what you're seeing is they, had all the, they have the supposed miracles and all of the hoopla and everything, but that's Jesus as the servant, not as the king. As soon as he comes in at the king, that's what knocks him out. See, because, well, yeah, what? Yeah, you came for the fish and loaves, not for me to be king over you. And that's why the body of Christ has to recognize that our job, or our job relationally is to love God, right? Right? But job-wise is to end this system. We're supposed to look, we're supposed to be looking for another country, a heavenly country, not trying to get God to fix our lives in this country. And that's the way he's preached, because that's a servant. If we're looking for another country, we're looking for another king. Because this, this system already has a king, and it's not a good system. It's not working. So we don't want our lives fixed. In the, well, I mean, we do. He, he's going to do stuff, right, in our lives, right? But that's not the end goal. The end goal is to end this system so we can get to another country that has another king. Until you, it's going to be difficult for Americans because Americans love this system. We love it. We don't want to give it up. Anybody else? Father, <clears throat> Father, we thank you once again for your word this morning. 
Thank you that you just keep pressing the button, our buttons, that you want to be king. And God, we want to recognize you as such. We want to honor you as such. We want to value you as such. And we want a different king over our lives than the one we've had most of our life. So God, as we sit here and we pray this, we know what we're asking It's easy to do when nothing's being wanted kingship over it in this exact moment. But God, as we go in the coming weeks, months, and years, Father, it's our heart's cry to have you deliver us from all those things we read in the beginning of the chapter. And God, we do thank you for terrible times as long as the good times come after when you're king. And we thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Woo! <laughs> what?